Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for uh, the organizers and uh, um, who have uh, sent an invitation to participate in this event. Every year, I try to participate at Cambridge Arbitration Day because I think it's a uh, it's a very different event from the rest of the conferences that uh, that are being organized uh, in London. I like the diversity of the participants, the diversity of the speakers, the topics, and this year specifically, I'm sure many of you were, were interested in the social aspect. Uh, of, of arbitration. So, uh, and thanks to Sylvia for, for giving a good introduction to, to my topic, actually. Um, and I, I'm also going to be speaking a little bit more about what you said. But my question was so I heard about that challenge. So, you are in your office, you have to uh, appoint an arbitrator, and everyone's like, okay, you're look for all the information that Sylvia told you about. And then you realize that, oh, actually, this, 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 uh, this arbitrator has been challenged. Um, and, and so what, what, first of all, let me just define the question here. Um, I'm going to be speaking about what is the impact of a challenge to an arbitrator, but also a challenge to uh, an arbitrator's decision, so two different things, first of all, uh, on the reputation of an arbitrator, right? So what do we mean by reputation of an arbitrator? Um, well, uh, let's, let's go back to uh, what has been defined by by scholars and authors in sociology. Reputation is a generally accepted upon collective perception, collective perception of an individual by some referred others, influenced by the individual actors themselves, and which does not occur instantaneously, but emerges over some period of time. So that's fair, so that's a sociologist. Um, so basically all the information that, that Sylvia has talked about concur towards a reputation of an arbitrator, right? And so why is this an important question today? Why, why, I think it's important to pause here for a second. Well, first of all, because there has been a lot of internal criticism of arbitration, and why is that? Is because contrary to when you go to courts, you choose your arbitrator, right? So you pay for the service. And, and a lot of you have probably uh, gone through the system like before. When you pay for a service, you ask for accountability. Right, so if, if it's free, usually you're kind of like, oh, all right, that's, that's it, I don't. But if you pay for it, so an arbitration, I think, is a good example of that. If you pay for the service and you have chosen also the arbitrator, so the, the fact that you've chosen our arbitrator is very important, well, then, you know, you ask for accountability. And, um, and that is why there's been a lot in, recently you have heard a lot about it, Sylvia has mentioned it, of a call for transparency. So all institutions have been publishing their decisions, and that I think is specific for, for commercial arbitration, because in investment arbitration, a lot of it is out there already. Um, and then we also, there's been a movement to ask for reasons, right? So not only publish the challenges to decisions, uh, challenge of arbitrators, but why, uh, why you know that challenges were, were sustained, or why it was not. There's also been a lot of external criticism of the system as a whole, and why do I talk about this right now? Because I think, when we say arbitration is as good as the arbitrator, I would say the system as a whole as well, and that is putting a lot of burden on our arbitrators out there, but I do think it's true. I think the whole system of arbitration as a whole uh, depends also on the quality of the arbitrators. And in fact, if you look at the program of, um, a lot of you have been following this, right? So in a couple of weeks, um, uh, people are meeting up in New York through the Uncentral Working Group, and they're gonna be addressing um, a, for a reform of the investment state dispute settlement system as a whole. And three of the main issues are um, you know, consistency of decision, appointment of arbitrators, and duration of the whole arbitral proceedings. And I would say that all these three points revolve around the quality of the arbitrators at some point as well. Right? So let's go to my topic. So I heard about challenge. What does the data tell us? Because I can tell you what the data tells, and I can tell you my user experience. I think I'm going to do both. So data. Um, I've been looking through it, and in fact, it's, uh, it's not easy to find information on this. Um, but if you look at the investment arbitration, because this is more, you know, published decision, it seems to suggest that the arbitrators are the most appointed. So there's some table that was, that was uh, made and actually a little bit of marking here. I'm not a public, you know, I haven't published this book, but this has been done by dear friends from the university here. It's an excellent book. Uh, they have a table on the most frequently appointed investment arbitrators, and it will be no surprise if I tell you that number one is Richard Stern, number two is Gabriel Cotton Collar, number three is versus Rory Bobicuna, and number four is Charles Burroughs. Right? So if you look at how many times these guys, and it's your 
the women have been challenged. Sorry. Um, well, uh, Bridget has been challenged five times, Deborah Malcolm Miller seven times, Charles Moore and Francis Corey Corey Earl Queen Edge just four times, right? So the number relatively doesn't tell you much, uh, but it does show you that in fact there's still there's not many instances of challenges. That these these people have been kept appointed over the years. So what the data seems to suggest, and when you look, there's actually no, and this is a call for all the students out there as well, please, we would also welcome a, a, a program because arbitrator intelligence is great and I think there's a lot of, of initiatives there. But there's nothing there where you can pop in the number of, you know, of a person and say it's been challenged how many times, right? And uh, how many times have the challenge been successful? And I'm sure it's pretty uh, possible to do that thing. Um, and I think one of the issues is because you don't have all the awards, right, public. So uh, it, would, it would not be conclusive if I would put, like, for example, you know, anyone's names here, um, I wouldn't get that information. So, you know, and that's, that's what people say. This, in fact, it doesn't seem to be much of a link between the fact that an arbitrator has been challenged and the fact that he ha or she has been reappointed. Reappointed by the users or reappointed by the institution. Um, so why, why is there a, not so much of a link? And, and I looked into that. Well, because, first of all, as I mentioned, um, there's not a lot of data available. Second of all, the challenges are very rare. I think I, sh I still need to insist on that point is that challenges, in, you know, if you look at the data of how many decisions there are out there um, and how many uh, challenges that there have been in proceedings, they're very rare. Second of all, a lot of those challenges are not successful. Okay, so just to give, for example, just uh, data recent of the LCIA, they published 32 challenges. Only a very few number of them, I think it was two or three, were, were, were successful. So it's like 2% of the, of the challenges that were filed um, were, were heard. And, and very few of, of that 2% were successful. So it's very little uh, are successful. And the, when there are challenges, and, and I think you know, we've discussed this a little bit this morning, um, there are two things. It doesn't mean that if you challenge an arbitrator, um, whether or not it's successful, it has anything to say about their expertise specifically, right? Um, because it could be a guerrilla law tactic, and that's I'm going to speak from the user's perspective. I've done a lot of cases um, in Asia, in China, in Vietnam, and currently, and, and as uh, I'm sure a lot of people have you been involved in this region as well, um, not systematically, but it happened a lot that when you have an award that is rendered as not in the favor of one of the parties, and that party is uh, Chinese or Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese uh, in my experience, actually, they're going to challenge the arbitrator uh, and say there was a bias, that it's not a fair decision. They're really going to try to contest the decision uh, uh, 100%. And right now, I'm in a case where actually the whole tribunal has been challenged before the institution, before VIAC. Then they have their proceedings ongoing in front of the Vietnamese courts, right? Um, and, um, and, and the, you know, the users have, uh, the, the other party has refused to come to, to the hearing. So, you know, when you hear about this kind of stuff, are you gonna say, well, I'm not gonna appoint those arbitrators because they've been unfair or biased? Not really, because it seems like it is a guerrilla tactic. And second of all, even if you challenge some arbitrators, right, and you present some arguments and say, well, actually there is a perceived a lack of independence and of impartiality here, and the arbitrator is going to respond and say, "Well, no." And even if that success, you know, if that sorry, the challenge is not successful, oftentimes, in my experience, the arbitrator steps down or resigns. Also, just because they say, "Well, I've created a perception that I was biased, I'm going to step down." Um, and I think that's important for their reputation as well. Is that like I don't even want to give you a hint that I. Uh, impartial or independent on either. There's no grounds for you to believe that, but I'm going to step down anyways. Um, but I would also say that not only, you know, the fact that there's no link is, uh, well, you know, I try to explain why, but I think that the data is not conclusive. And again, that's a call for all the people here working at the university and doing research. Because what I'm going to say is that it's actually impossible to measure the impact of a challenge on the party's refusal to appoint an arbitrator. So again, sitting in my office, um, someone's like, hey, do you want to appoint Wendy Miles? <laughs> All right. And I said, yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and then someone's like, oh, she's challenged. She said this. So I'm like, oh, no, well, actually, you know what? Not going to appoint. 
How do you know that? Right? You can't measure a negative inference, right? You can't measure that. So how would you know that the fact that, you know, Wendy in that, in that case has been challenged and I haven't appointed her because I'll have data on how many appointments she's had, but it's impossible to know that because of that, there's been a negative inference. Second thing, maybe I hear that she's been challenged and I'm like, why was she challenged? I look it up, I see it, and I'm like, well, actually, that's probably exactly why, if it's an issue conflict or something, uh, that's been raised because she has previously uh, said something or published something um, that is, you know, one party decided that, that it was going to create an appearance bias. I might think, well, actually, this is going to help my case. I want her specifically to do that, right? Um, so, again, that's an example of when someone has been challenged and you're, it's actually going to have a positive reaction on the appointment. Um, the second thing I'm going to mention is that actually, in fact, what I think. Um, so that is focused on challenge of, of arbitrators. Challenge of decisions is actually another thing, right? Because challenge of, of decisions, um, well, as all of you know, and I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it's very um, difficult. To, you can't really appeal an ar I mean, ar arbitration versus court proceedings. The thing is, the decision is final and binding. So you can only really challenge the decision for a very limited ground, right? Um, there is, you know, always section 68 and 69 of, of the Arbitration Act that has cited where there is a possibility of appealing the decision on a, when there's been a gross error on a point of law. Um, and here you can always argue, well, actually, you know what, that arbitrator really got it wrong. He didn't know the, the law or the facts at all, and they're not going to appoint someone who is really just so faulty. Um, and that might, that might actually happen. But again, like, it, it really depends. Like, is it because it was a sole arbitrator or it's a panel? If it's a panel, how can you, can, can you decide, like, it was because of that arbitrator or this arbitrator. And, um, and going back to what Sylvia said, I actually think that uh, what is most important is the other kind of information that you get, right? And I, this is a nice summary of what Sylvia said earlier, and this is a, comes from the Queen Mary arbitration system, is that where actually do you find information about arbitrators? Top thing is word of mouth. So again, we're going back to the definition of reputation here, right? So word of mouth might include he's been challenged and not been challenged, but I think it's much, much more than that. Internal colleagues, publicly available information, profile, access to counsel, et cetera, et cetera. Second question is, what other information do users want? And this one is interesting. So of course, we use the word of decision. So right, so it's not just challenge decision, it's like the substantive um, you know, points that have been made in the decisions I think are very important. The approach to substantive issues, the second one, which I think there is no overlap to the previous award and decision at that point. But degree of availability. That is also very important, right? Is the behavior of your arbitrator. Is he going to be available? Is he going to be responsive? Is he going to be prepared? And in fact, there's an award category of GAR for the most prepared arbitrator now, right? So it, it shows that it, 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 it really matters for the users, degree of availability. The degree of availability, I would say, also includes health issues sometimes. Uh, I have had people tell me, oh, no, don't, don't appoint this person. He's, he's, he's not well, you know? And I'm not going to tell you who that was, but there has been challenges on arbitrators because they're too old. I'm going to say that again, yes, but there are plenty for young people out there to arbitrate. <laughs> um, there has been challenges on arbitrators because they fell asleep between the, you know, during the arbitration. Um, and, and then the That's the fault of the lawyers. What is that? That's the fault of the lawyers. So again, this is, this is very, I think, you know, focusing on whether an arbitrator has been challenged or not is, is probably, in my view, it's, an, it's a very good question. It's a difficult question to answer for the reasons I explained why. But I think this information is actually very interesting. Um, do you have access to enough information? 70% of people say, yes, we do, actually. We have enough, uh, uh, you know, enough information. Despite that, I still think there should be more publicity and transparency and, and, and more information out there. Um, and, and this is just a, a snapshot of what Sylvia mentioned before, of all the tools that we have and that are great and I think can be improved. Um, that's also an interesting question. Would you like to be able to provide an assessment of arbitrary? So a trip advisor. Here we go. Okay, so you enter. Da, da, da. This is arbitrator intelligence. I think it's good. I think it's a really good idea. Yes, 80% of people agree with that. And then how? 
88% say we should report to the arbitral institution. So it would be you're shifting the burden to the institution because the institution, first of all, can make recommendations also for arbitrators and then they appoint arbitrators directly as well and then they would centralize that information. So I think that's very that's a very interesting point as well. Um, I'm just going to conclude in saying that, in fact, the original question that was asked is, has the challenge an impact on reputation? And I would say it's very really interesting to think about, has the reputation of an arbitrator had an impact on the challenges that you might make on the arbitrator? And I think that is also, I would answer this by the positive thing. <coughs> Oftentimes, uh, you know, I would think the reputation includes whether or not a person has been challenged or not, what has happened in the past, uh, if, if we know for them that they're not, you know, they uh, they have a bias or, or this or or that, you know, specific uh, specific party. Um, for example, just to give a quick example, because I was going to cite to the most appointed arbitrators, I don't think anyone in this room, you know, uh, what does not. Um, that you know, there's tendency people in investment arbitration know that there are some arbitrators that are more friendly towards state and some others that are more friendly towards investors. You know, and then there's always the Richard Stanner versus Charles Bauer uh, match going on, right? And um, and in fact, you know, I think this reputation guides the appointments and also guides the challenges in the end. Um, the other thing is, I would say, is that the reputation that an arbitrator has is very important because it has a normative effect on, on arbitration as a whole. So another concrete example is the UCAS case, which a lot of people have, have heard about. Um, there is an, an interesting point in the UCAS case that actually wasn't decided at the end, it was the challenge on the arbitrator because of the secretary that was used. Hmm. So that was the argument of, hey, you know, we appointed three people on the panel, the decision was rendered by four. Okay, we don't know who that third person was, and it's the role of the secretary. And it was the first time this argument was made, right? And then it was made again in a separate case uh, before the British Court Court. And the second time, they decided the matter and they said that you know it was a conclusion and they denied it. But what was important in that is that I say it has a normative effect is because now there's been guidelines that were made that were published by the SCIA, by the ICC. There's been conferences and we're just talking about it um, to to you know have to uh, regulate that role of secretaries. Um, in arbitration. So um, I do think that challenges and reputation generally have a normative effect on the self-regulation of the whole system. Um, and I think I'm going to stop here because I think I've used all my time. <laughs> I guess there is not. Thank you very much. Thank you.